Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Nancy Nason Clark. Dr. Clark holds a PhD in sociology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. She joined UNB's Faculty of Arts in 1984, as I did, and currently chairs the Department of Sociology. Dr. Nason Clark teaches undergraduate and graduate sociology courses in research methods, gender, religion, and violence. Her research involves several projects examining the relationship between abuse, faith, gender, and culture, and has taken her to many parts of the world, including India, Eastern Europe, and the Caribbean. Since 2005, Dr. Nason Clark has directed the Religion and Violence e-learning project, or RAVE. Funded by the Lilly Endowment, RAVE is a web-based series of resources and online training initiatives to assist religious leaders around the world in responding to abuse victims, perpetrators, and their families. Dr. Nason Clark is the author or co-author of several books, including The Battered Wife, No Place for Abuse, and Refuge from Abuse. She has published more than 75 articles and book chapters on her research and has been invited to, spe to speak at conferences around the world. Uh, I would also point out that she has most recently been uh, uh, nominated to be the, a university research scholar, and we uh, congratulate her for that. Her most recent work considers the role of faith communities and religious leaders in helping abusive religious men become accountable for their activities. Dr. Nason Clark's talk this evening is entitled, Holy Hush or Shattered Silence, Religion as Part of the Solution to Domestic Violence, Not Just Part of the Problem. Dr. Nason Clark. Thank you, Jim, and distinguished guests. And thank you all so much for coming. You all had a million things to do tonight, including raking your lawn and having a nice barbecue. And you chose to spend this hour with us, with me. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate that. I want to acknowledge um, the funders of my work. And you will see here some of the funding sources and a number of the graduate students with whom I've worked over the years, and the names are here of those who've worked with me on issues of domestic violence. And I have to say that one of the greatest privileges of having been a university professor for many, many years is being able to work with young, dedicated, keen, energetic people. And I just want you to know that this is a great, great privilege, and I don't take it for granted. We see on the next slide a little bit about the outline of my research program. And this is a community lecture, and so I'm not going to be talking directly about a lot of the research projects specifically. I'm going to be drawing some conclusions and summary statements from them. But this is an outline of some of the qualitative and quantitative studies that I have conducted over the years with the help of those who work with me. Let me introduce you to the idea of violence in families of faith. Every Sunday, millions of women across Canada, the United States, and indeed around the world, join together with believers in congregational life to worship God and fellowship and study with those of like-minded faith. Amidst the singing, the teaching, and the sweet Sunday smiles, there is a very ugly secret. Sometimes the secret is disclosed in the pastoral study, together with the fear, the shame, and the tears it creates. Sometimes part of the secret is whispered to others who inquire of bruises or absences or the look of dismay that can cloud the eyes as well as the countenance. Often it is disclosed one woman to another, hushed, as if speaking it right out loud would jeopardize the friendship, the trust, or the practical help that is so critical to both victim and her children. Violence against women is a pervasive reality. It exists in every country of the world, amongst all people groups, 
in every faith community. And it knows no socioeconomic boundaries. Rich women, poor women, black women, white women, educated women, religious women, beautiful women, all women can be potential targets. Governments around the globe are waking up to the reality of the devastating consequences of violence against women, and public money is starting to trickle towards a greater understanding of the problem, reforming the judicial system to respond more quickly, and providing health and other social services. Yet amidst the growing recognition of the everyday fears of abused women, the bruises and the battering they experience and their needs for safety and security, where are the churches? Where are the people of deep religious commitment? And why are so many of us still sound asleep? You see, a holy hush pervades many religious organizations, cathedrals and small churches alike. Leaders, as well as followers, deny that it is happening in their own congregations, unsure of how to respond with spiritual comfort and practical sensitivity. As a result, many are prone to sweep the issue under the proverbial church carpet. Let's be honest. There is a lot of evidence that a holy hush still permeates our houses of worship and our congregational life. In case you need convincing, consider some of the evidence from our research. Most religious leaders do not name violence in the family context for what it is. Instead, they refer to family conflict or disagreements or problems of communication. Most religious leaders have never visited the transition house in their local area. They do not know any of the workers there by name nor do they have their phone number in an easily accessible location. Most clergy have never preached a message that explicitly condemns wife abuse, child abuse, or abuse directed towards men. Most ministers do not include any information about violence in their premarital counseling packages with couples. Most leaders of youth groups never talk about violence in dating relationships nor do they encourage young women and men to identify and practice healthy interpersonal encounters. When women who've been victimized come to their faith communities for help, pastors and other religious leaders are often reluctant to refer them to outside community sources of help. In other words, to the experts. Sometimes religious leaders do not offer spiritual comfort to victims, like reading passages from the text or praying for strength. Yet, there is a rumbling in some congregational context that cannot be silenced. It is getting louder all the time. It is determined to shatter the silence about abuse, particularly in families of faith. And that is what we are here tonight to talk about. When abuse strikes at home in a religious family, Many women look first and foremost to their pastor and their congregation for help. What will they find? What advice will they be given? Our work of knowledge translation, where we use the data from our studies but prepare it for dissemination to a wider public, uses the motif of stained glass to tell the story that we have heard from victims in our research. Stained glass, long a symbol associated with Christian churches, is a reminder that beauty can be born from brokenness. Jagged pieces of glass, rough to the touch and piercing to the skin, can be transformed. This is the story to which I now turn, a story to emerge from our fieldwork. In the first pane of glass, you see there is peace. Different family members are represented by different colors, and the black strands represent unity amongst them. But in the second, you see that chaos has come, and violence creates that chaos. There is no rewinding the tape now to go back to the first pane of glass. The third pane of glass, you see, is the aftermath. 
This is when confusion and despair and, and, and discouragement begins to come in, flood in to the person who's experienced abuse. Followed by the fourth, where there's a rebuilding process, which includes looking at the various pieces of one's life to see how it can be refigured or reset in the aftermath of violence hitting at home. And then that's followed by renewal. That's what women tell us, beauty that can be born out of brokenness. And we move to the sixth pain, which is new beginnings. The colors are the same. There's connection between the, the various family members, but the picture looks very different than it did in the beginning. You see, when the language of the spirit infuses the language of contemporary culture, images can be created from broken pieces of glass. The language of the spirit involves words of religious comfort to victims and words of religious accountability to offenders. The language of contemporary culture involves print recognizing principles of safety and empowerment and empathy and justice. For religious men and women weaving together the language of the spirit with the language of contemporary culture is very powerful. When religious leaders speak out against violence, they use their moral authority to bring healing to victims and call those who act abusively to accountability. It begins to shatter the silence of the holy hush. We turn now to begin to hear some stories that have emerged from our fieldwork. And the first has to do with the stories of victims and survivors. And I tell Mildred's story. Mildred and Russell Jennings lived one life on the outside and another at home. They had five grown children, all of whom had been very successful. While this older couple was sliding further and further into debt, to outsiders it appeared they had everything they needed and wanted. The truth was that Russell hungered after power and status and satisfied his longings with purchases, like new cars and flashy gadgets. He gave little thought to Mildred or her needs. Mildred, whose mother lived with them, was shy and retiring by nature. She was very involved in her church and at home overly concerned to please her husband. Russell was a controlling man, and Mildred's response to his control was to try harder and harder to please him. In fact, she felt caught between the very real needs of her aged mother and her husband's unrealistic demands. He tried to control every small detail of her life, including where she went and with whom. When she resisted his control, he would adopt one of two strategies, start yelling, and belittle her, or turn silent. On one occasion, he flew into a rage and tried to kill her. But Mildred was very forgiving of Russell, trying to live a life where she exemplified the scriptural imperative to forgive 70 times 7. Not surprisingly, Mildred suffered from low self-esteem. This was compounded by a childhood experience of watching her father treat her mother poorly. Mildred sought pastoral assistance when Russell kicked her and her mother out of their home. In fact, these two older women were given two hours to leave the family home forever. They had nowhere to turn but their pastor. Through counseling, the pastor recognized Mildred's spiritual needs, her questions like, where was God now? Would she ever be forgiven for leaving her husband? And the pastor tried to help her see her misguided religious convictions related to forgiveness and suffering. He helped her see that God was not asking her to ignore the pain of the past, but rather to hold Russell accountable. Then the pastor tried to help legal counsel understand why Mildred was so forgiving. In Mildred's case, the pastor acted as a mediator between her spiritual questions and her very practical problems. He tried to challenge her misunderstanding of the Christian concept of forgiveness, and he offered a needed respite to what was offered to her in the community. 
Similar to many hundreds of stories of abuse we've heard over the last 20 years, Mildred's spiritual needs were primary on her road to personal well-being. Like a shattered window, her life had been blown apart as she knew it. The resources that religious women seek in the aftermath of domestic violence in part differentiate them from other abused women. They are often very reluctant to seek secular, community-based sources of support, preferring instead to look to others of like-minded faith for assistance. Since many faith communities place the intact family on a pedestal, Religious women are especially prone to blame themselves for the abuse. They believe they've promised God to stay in the relationship forever, and they experience both the fear and the reality of rejection at church when attempts to repair the relationship fail. It is imperative that those who work in the helping professions understand some of the unique and specific needs of clients who are religious. We now turn to Ben's story, a story of a man who acted abusively. Ben had just switched careers and recently changed marriage partners. He's 40 years old, he teaches science to junior high students, and he lives under the same roof as his seven children in a blended family situation. In the aftermath of violence, he begins to go for help in a faith-based batterer intervention program because his wife was unwilling for him to come home unless he agreed to go to classes. His wife, who's employed as a physiotherapist, learns of the agency through some of her friends. Often in conversation, Ben uses religious language and scriptural references. He wants to intimidate, but since the facilitators at the program know this language too, his power is dismantled. Before he began attending classes at the intervention program, the couple sought help at their church, but Ben was not happy with the pastoral counsel they received. He wanted their minister to invoke church discipline against his wife and make public their marital woes. When the pastor would not collaborate with this plan, Ben left the church. Justice accountability and change are all imperative features of intervention services offered to women and to men who have been abusive. While some come voluntarily, most men who attend a batter intervention class do so because they have little choice in the matter. They've been mandated by the courts as a result of a conviction, or they've been referred by their wives or therapists or clergy as a final gasp before the relationship is considered over. Religious women in particular are very hopeful that intervention programs can change their violent partners. Since many religious women do not want to terminate their relationship with their abuser either temporarily or forever, they hold out great faith that if only their partner would go to a program, the violence would cease and peace would be restored to their marriage. We have studied 1,000 closed case files in one agency, actually the number's closer to 1,200, and when we've compared the men in this program with other secular programs, what we've found is that a higher proportion of men who have witnessed or experienced abuse in their childhood homes find their way to faith-based programs, while the rates of alcohol abuse and criminal histories are similar. Another finding to emerge from this data is the role of clergy in encouraging or mandating men to seek <coughs> spiritual help. In fact, men who were clergy referred were more likely to complete and graduate from a program than those who are mandated by a judge alone. Barb Fisher Townsend and I are, are currently working on a manuscript that's under contract with Oxford University Press where we're talking about the stories of religious men who've been abusive. Sharing a religious worldview with the other men in the program might actually become a safe place for abusive men to challenge themselves and each other and look toward a day when their abusive past will no longer control their present reality. When religious leaders are able to walk alongside men and their families, the possibility of ongoing accountability is enhanced. 
It is very powerful for a man who has acted abusively to see his faith community as supportive of his decision to change and to pursue wholeness. In this way, pastors and other religious leaders are uniquely positioned to augment the process of recovery. For Ben and others like him, faith is a core construct central to any understanding of male entitlement, power, and control. We now move to the story of Reverend Robert Wilkins. He was the pastor of a mid-sized church in a bedroom community, sandwiched between a growing industrial city on one side and farmland on the other. Approaching 40, he'd been in the pastorate long enough to realize, well, that he wasn't perfect, but also to realize that life was rather overwhelming in his office and that his level of preparation was woefully inadequate. He estimates that 30% of his pastoral work involves relationship or marital counseling. As a former army chaplain, professor, pastor, yeah, he could be a professor too, but <laughs> Pastor Wilkins, he's not Terry, of course, is comfortable working in a multidisciplinary team, but he hesitates to refer members of his congregation to secular counselors. His reluctance is based on his experience. When asked to recount the story of a woman who sought his assistance, he tells us about Joan. Joan came to him fearing for her life and the lives of her two children. Her husband had grown up in an abusive environment, and they had been married for 18 years. Pastor Robert says, it had not been a happy relationship, but it was tolerable some of the time. He pushed and shoved her. But then his scare tactic is to take out his hunting rifle, lay it on the bed and say, okay, I'm going to shoot myself and someone else too. Joan had endured this kind of abuse for years. In the aftermath of his battery, he would be remorseful by her presence and promise to change. But change never came. Robert Wilkins found himself in the awkward situation of counseling Joan to leave a marriage to find respite and safety for herself and her children. Joan followed through on the pastor's referral suggestion, but her husband William was not willing to seek help because from his perspective, there was nothing wrong, nothing that needed repair. From our studies of religious leaders, we've learned how difficult it is for pastors to see their intervention as successful if the marriage ends in divorce. Many clergy feel pressure to keep families together and marriages intact. In this way, pastoral counselors frequently find themselves in a very difficult double bind. They are stalwart supporters of family values, including a reluctance to see couples divorce. Yet many of the families who seek their counsel need to separate in order to ensure their safety. With limited training and a lack of resources at their disposal, they've not yet learned to identify that it is the relationship that has failed, not their advice. Translating the rhetoric of happy family living into practical help for women, men, and couples in crisis is no easy matter. As a result, pastoral counselors sometimes feel that they're caught in the crossfire between an ideology of the family that their denominations and churches hold dear and the nature, severity, and persistence of male aggression and abuse. While pastors differ greatly in their counseling experience and the advice that they offer, we found no evidence that clergy deliberately or directly dismiss an abused woman's call for help. I turn now to Karen's story. Karen Mott is the executive director of a women's shelter in a large metropolitan city. Her staff is overworked, and although she is a reasonable employer, the needs of the community, especially women and their children who've been violated, are ever-present on her mind. She is caught between the demands of her work, her social work background, and her knowledge of self-care and that she needs to lead a balanced life. On the job, there are always fiscal concerns. So Karen finds herself chasing money for needed repairs to the facility and for workshops and other things in the community. 
In the downtown urban area where the transition house is located, there are a growing number of immigrant families, and the diversity of women at the shelter reflects these societal changes. It is important to Karen that the staff be respectful of all women's cultural and religious experiences, but this is very difficult at a practical level. Most of her staff does not have specific knowledge or life experiences that would enable them to talk authoritatively to Muslim or Buddhist women or Jewish women or Mormons or Pentecostals. In fact, highly religious women of any tradition are difficult for the workers at the shelter. Sometimes there are individual workers who blame the religious backgrounds of the women for the abuse. But Karen has been diligent in helping her staff see that there are many religious leaders who speak out against violence. That is why she's been involved in the Interfaith Committee on Domestic Violence. Despite her optimism, Karen knows firsthand that not all religious leaders are willing to work with the shelters, and she knows that other pastors have sometimes told women to suffer in the name of Christ. Yet, she continues to work with those who she comes in contact with whether or not they are part of the churches. Because from Karen's point of view, faith and violence cannot be separated in the minds of a religious victim of abuse. Religious women, you see, are especially vulnerable when they are abused, for they are very likely to hold the intact family in high regard and to consider separation and divorce as unsatisfactory options. Thus, a community response needs to include input from various religious traditions if it wishes to meet the needs of all people in a given jurisdiction. When a pastor or other religious leader explains to a follower that abuse is wrong and a violation of how their faith tradition understands marriage before God, it has a powerful impact, much more powerful than the same words spoken by a social worker to an abused religious woman. Of course, not all members of faith communities will want assistance from their religious leader when domestic violence strikes, but for those who do, it is critical that such help be made available. Referrals between resources are very important, yet our data has revealed that amongst those clergy who are poorly trained to respond to domestic violence, there is a great reluctance to refer those to who do come for help. In other words, where referrals are needed most, they are most unlikely to occur. Since many faith traditions celebrate family values, it is imperative that the leaders speak out when, when abuse happens, and a coordinated community response is more likely to help this to happen. When religious leaders are involved and invited to the table, they speak the language of their tradition using the texts and prayers and other rituals inherent in their traditions. Because, you see, breaking the cycle of violence requires the input of many, many people. And it augments the healing journey of religious people when their leaders are involved. Many in the secular community do not like to work with clients who are particularly religious. Without spiritual credentials, these workers find it difficult to challenge the religious ideation that is believed to give license by many to abuse. For collaborative ventures between churches and community agencies to be successful, what I like to call paving the pathway between the steeple and the shelter, personnel from both paradigms must recognize the need to work together. A cultural language that is devoid of religious symbols, meaning and legitimacy, is relatively powerless to alter our religious victims' resolve to stay in the marriage, no matter what the cost. Correspondingly, the language of the spirit must also include references to practical resources and secular knowledge. Otherwise, spiritual language alone may compromise a victim's need for safety, security, and financial resources to care for herself and her children, or a perpetrator's need for justice and restraint. So in conclusion, shattering the silence, what can every congregation do? I've listed five things. 
They can ensure that safety is the top priority and that information is available. They can place a poster and other information near the pastor's study or a waiting area that says Christian love should not hurt. Secondly, they can place a brochure on abuse in every church washroom. In fact, I had a status of women grant many, many years ago that provided those for churches. And almost every month still, when the last brochure is gone, if they've forgotten to, um, to Xerox it, I get a call. You see, bathroom stalls are one of the very few confidential places in a church. Third, they can identify one Sunday in the calendar year to discuss abuse and place an insert in the bulletin. They can mention the needs of the shelter and they can offer assistance that might be financial or in-kind donations. Next, they can ensure that the youth group has one evening, at least once a term, where abuse in dating relationships is discussed and where teens are encouraged to ask for assistance if they or someone they know is part of an unhealthy relationship. And the issue can be discussed in all premarital counseling that occurs. Our research has shown that when a pastor raises this issue in premarital counseling, a woman is much more likely to go back to a religious leader later if the abuse occurs. Eradicating family violence is a central component to healthy relationships everywhere, including the church. It is time to stop the holy hush. It is time to wake up to the reality and pervasiveness abuse, both within and beyond the walls of the faith community. Every congregation can reach out to victims and survivors and their dependent children. Every congregation can be a caring community, a place where it is safe to disclose the reality of abuse and know that you will receive both practical and spiritual support. The implications of this on the next slide, I've put as two questions. Is your church or house of worship a safe place for a victim of abuse to disclose her suffering. But we could turn the question another way. We could say, is your community agency a safe place for a person to disclose that he or she is religious? There is ample evidence that religious faith and domestic violence are commingled. Whether an abused religious woman or a religious man who acts abusively is offered help first by their church or through a community-based agency, it is critical that those who, who respond understand both the issue of domestic violence and the nature of religious faith. While safety and security must always be the first priority, accurate, practical advice is also imperative, offered in a way that respects one's faith tradition and professional best practices. Perspectives informed by faith must be part of the solution to a community-based response to abuse. Perspectives informed by secular training, experience, and credentials must be part of the solution to a faith-based response. For this to happen, for bridges to be built between churches and their communities, and for the movement between them to be bi-directional, there must be mutual respect and mutual understanding built on a foundational belief that ending domestic violence involves the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mason Clark. I'd now like to invite the Reverend Dr. Terry Atkinson, senior pastor at Brunswick Street Baptist Church, to comment on Dr. Mason Clark's talk. Thank you, uh, Jim, and thank you, Nancy, for inviting me to be here tonight to deal with a very, very important topic that is dear to my heart. I probably don't represent the typical clergyman because I come from a little bit of a different background. I was a social worker for 10 years before I sensed that call to ministry. I've been in pastoral ministry for the last 26 years, but certainly understanding the, some of these issues much better from my previous life has really helped and enhanced me, I think, in coming into the clergy role and working in the churches. Really have appreciated all that Dr. Clark has given to us 
in her research and her literature and the things that she has presented to our community over the years, and I've worked closely with her on a number of projects, so uh, it is, again, a joy to be here tonight. I want to share just a couple of thoughts, and uh, my experience in this as a pastor now, and, and I have encountered a number of situations in churches I've been in where there has been abuse going on and we have come alongside. One of the things that I have struggled with, and I don't know, uh, Dr. Clark, if you've really worked on this research, but one of the things that I've discovered is often when we get involved in the church component, um, the family, it's really difficult to support both abuser and victim. Uh, because then we are seen as, as kind of, you know, siding with one versus the other. And what we have discovered, what I've experienced, is that often one of them has to go to another church. And uh, one of the things I've tried to do is, when I work with people like this, is that if we get into a situation where it looks like we're not going to be able to support both the victim and the abuser, then I try to work with the individual to encourage them to go to another faith community, even talk to a pastor to make the inroads and relationships so there will be support from both sides. The other thing I wanted to comment on was the premarital counseling. And, and again, I, I think this is, again, one of the experiences that I've had over the years, as you do a lot of premarital counseling, getting couples ready for weddings, one of the struggles I've had over the years is that a lot of our premarital counseling falls on deaf ears. Uh, the couples usually come pretty, you know, glassy-eyed and just keen to get into this relationship, do not hear a lot of things we say. So one of the things that I've done in my, in my uh, experience as a pastor is that I always uh, share with the couple that after the wedding is finished, I do a follow-up with them a year later. I find that more effective because then they're ready to listen. And so I find that's a much more beneficial time to deal with things like you mentioned, Nancy, in, in that whole process. That doesn't mean I don't mention it in the premarital, but again, I find a lot of times there's not a lot of listening. And so I think a follow-up later is much more beneficial. The information in washrooms, we've incorporated that at Brunswick Street, and uh, we've gone through a lot of them, and we just keep making copies, and we don't have to go back to you, because I always ensure that when we get down to one or two, that we make more copies. What excites me about the fact is that in our church, those are going out on a regular basis. People are picking up those pamphlets, and you're right, that is a safe place. And so we do try to educate in that, uh, that rain, realm. I think one of your comments you made I have to agree so strongly with is that many times as clergy we are unsure of how to respond. And I look back even at my own seminary training and it was woefully lacking in this whole area. Um, again, I draw on my 10 years experience as a social worker and working in child abuse and, and family abuse situations from my experience as opposed to my seminary training. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, I believe, in our seminaries to train our clergy to, to be aware of this situation and know how better to respond when they find themselves in situations like that. Um, again, when I move from church to church and what I have always done is when I move into a new church, one of the first things I do is find out what are the community agencies in my community and get to know the individuals as well as I can. Most clergy don't do that. And so we have an uphill battle here that a lot of clergy just kind of stay in their own little area and that's it. So we do need to educate and we need to grow on that. Having said that, I think your, your comment at the end about there needs to be that mutual respect, and again, I would echo that very strongly. As much as we as clergy need to respect the need for us to make referrals and to connect with the agencies in our community, we also need to have that same kind of mutual respect from the agencies back to the faith communities. Um, as much as it's important for pastors to go to a transition house to get to know the workers there, I would encourage some of the community agencies to get to know some of the clergy and faith community uh, that, that is in that area. So there needs to be that mutual respect going back and forth. And to be honest, the only way that's going to happen is through individual relationships being built. 
and that's one thing certainly at Brunswick Street we are working hard on is to do our best to build those relationships with the agencies in our communities so that we can work together in this whole situation. Finally, I just want to mention that um, uh, we dis have discovered, and I discovered that very early on in ministry, that ministry is messy. That's the word that we use. Because when you are dealing with people's lives, when you are dealing with relationships, it is often very, very messy. And so as clergy, we need to be well aware of that when we're dealing with people, but to recognize that there is a lot of help out there. And the more we collaborate and work together, the more I am convinced we will shatter that silence. But I am encouraged. I believe we are doing better, and I believe that we are moving in the right direction. And uh, I know as long as I am in the, the, the faith community, I will continue to do my best to educate and to work towards shattering that silence. Thank you, Pastor Atkinson. I now invite Lorraine Wally, director of the Fredericton Sexual Assault Crisis Center, to give her comments. Thank you. Thought I would get away with not having to move that down, but I guess I had to. Um, I too want to echo Reverend Atkinson's words about um, how happy uh, I am to be here to to um, be part of this. Um, I've long admired your work in this area and, and was uh, so glad that it was happening. I think that uh, in in your talk tonight, you really pointed out a lot of options and opportunities for action for all of us working in this field and for uh, faith communities working together. One thing that, um, that Nancy did speak of very clearly was that need for coordinated responses. And speaking for uh, my own agency um, and our, experiencing, our experience of networking and establishing and sitting on various committees, we really see the benefits of, of doing that. Uh, it's very easy to sit in your own office, in your own little world, and, and do your work and, and, and think that you know, you're doing it well, but there's such a benefit from getting together with other service providers who have perhaps different mandates but often have uh, different or the same outcome or, or goals that they want to reach. So I really think there's uh, ample opportunities for making connections between community agencies and faith communities. Uh, as someone working in a, in a community agency with limited human and, and other resources, uh, I'm a little bit challenged thinking uh, in terms of how we can do that with faith communities where there are so many and, and um, within faith communities, many different churches. So um, I think there are ways to do that. So we just have to find those ways, uh, not think about having to maybe knock on a lot of doors. Uh, there are ways that we can bring people together in different ways. Uh, I will say that we've had lots of contacts by ministers or priests or pastors over the years that are looking for information or, or presentations um, or looking to refer women uh, for counseling and support. And this type of networking uh, works really well. Uh, in the past five years especially, we've developed uh, service provider workshops where we um, offer regularly to the community um, sexual assault crisis intervention training. Uh, we've had nurses, teachers, police officers uh, take that training, just to name a few different professions. And then they incorporate that into their work. And I see that as a, also a good option for those in faith communities also um, who are going to encounter, no doubt, uh, people that are experiencing abuse and are approaching them for help. And we really see that, uh, or we, I guess we have that understanding that we can't know everything about every issue out there as service providers, but we can get that basic information. So when someone does come to us for help, we at least have the basics. We know how to respond and we know where to refer them. And we know how to do that within our roles and mandates. One crucial component of this, uh, this training that we do for service providers focuses on secondary wounding. And it's really about understanding the power of that moment when that person comes to you for help, when they reach out. 
what kind of response will they get and what kind of impact will that have? Secondary wounding happens when people, institutions, caregivers, or others that the, the person comes to for help uh, blames, shames, or in some way punishes them. They can experience that from informal support providers, from their family, friends, partners, or other formal support providers. And this isn't necessarily, it, it's not often caused by um, or motivated by deliberate or intentional desire to harm, but usually from a lack of awareness or ignorance of the, of the issue. And the impact of secondary wounding is profound, and it really uh, serves to uh, increase the abused victim's sense of self-blame and low self-esteem. And a lot of survivors of abuse describe secondary wounding as being more devastating than the original abuse or assault. We often find that we spend a lot of time as counselors working on uh, the harm that's done. And what we see is that that harm can be prevented by specialized training and education. And so I, I again see that opportunity where um, sitting at the table with other service providers and other, um, other uh, communities really can help to prevent this from happening. Uh, one of the comments, I guess, that, um, that I was struck by was um, in your story with, with Pastor Wilkins, who, who talked about hesitating to refer members of his congregation to secular counselors, uh, and that, um, m that secular counselors, in his experience, were not open to the spiritual. And perhaps this really uh, highlights that need to better understand each other's roles and, and how we approach th uh, this issue. From our perspective at, uh, at the Sexual Assault Center, our counselors, of course, are specialized in the area of sexual violence counseling, and we work from a trauma-informed framework with a firm practice of working from where the client is at and what she brings in with her, past experiences, lifestyles, um, community connections, values, and her beliefs. And we've often worked with women who are um, very religious, somewhat religious, or, or identify themselves as, as spiritual. And we don't see it as a barrier to our work with her. And in fact, we acknowledge that this is often a source of support, a source of community, and a support of safety for her. And we would never presume to offer spiritual guidance. We see that as the role of, of her pastor or priest, but we would certainly see the value if she identifies that in, in, in her healing and in um, how she works through what she's experienced. So again, we see ourselves as part of that network of, of support um, and being able, through connections, to be able to provide the, the right responses that she may need. Um, I guess in, in closing, um, I, I again want to, uh, to stress that it, it, as Nancy said, it is about that working together, and that is how, to use your words, we will shatter that silence. And I think it's really promising to hear the positive um, and collaborative work that was highlighted in your research. And I hope that this is happening in our community, and, and it is um, our responsibility at the Sexual Assault Center, of course, to, uh, to be part of that. And I'm also really encouraged by uh, the work that you're doing uh, at your church, Reverend At Atkinson, and, and the, um, the efforts that you make to understand this issue and, and bring that to your congregation. And part of that shattering of silence also um, is, is um, creating that climate of understanding and awareness and support within a congregation. And so using those tools of pamphlets and posters and information that's um, that is strategically placed uh, in an area. It really helps provide uh, an atmosphere where someone who is experiencing abuse is going to feel safe about coming forward. They're going to know that if they do come forward that people are willing to hear them um, and that they will understand. And we've all heard recently uh, that there can be some very tragic outcomes 
to disclosures when they're not handled in a, a caring and understanding and in supportive environment. So um, I think that there's so much that we can do and I think that already has been done in, in the work that, um, that Nancy's been involved with over the years and in, in various churches to, to ensure that, um, that they are creating that, that supportive environment for, for people coming forward. So finally, uh, again, that um, we have those opportunities to work together. It's all our responsibility to do that uh, because we, we can't work in isolation and it really, it does take all of us to be able to, um, to provide that full network of support um, to ensure that, that women get the help that they need when they come forward for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wally. Um, I think um, as we think about our uh, question and answer period, I just wanted to comment that uh, the um, tremendously encouraging aspect of Dr. Nathan Clark's work um, hit home to me when I recently had a chance to count up the number of presentations, lectures, and seminars that she has held across North America and around the world just in the last few years. I, I tell you, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. And um, very encouraged to see her receiving invitations from seminaries and Bible schools to uh, be engaged in their uh, work as well. So did I give you enough time to think of a question? We're going to, uh, we're going to uh, open the floor to questions, and I'm going to ask you to identify yourself. I'm also going to ask you to um, speak up clearly um, and uh, to identify yourself. And if you happen to come from a, a, a have a significant role in a group, uh, please feel free to, uh, to mention that as well. Uh, we have a few minutes, and so I open the floor and invite our folks to come up. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, or or the answerer will uh, provide um, a, a restatement of your question, not a change of it. I mean, a, a repetition of your question, so that we can have it uh, clearly for everyone and let the question and answer uh, be done. So, do we have? I have a question. Yes, absolutely. My name is Barb Fisher Townsend. I work with uh, Nancy Mason Clark. And I have a question for Reverend Atkinson, and I, I, I must admit, I was a bit alarmed and concerned. When you mentioned that when you're dealing with the both an abuser and uh, an abused person, one of them may have to leave the church. My question is, is that the abuser who's now got to go find another faith community so that the person who's been victimized can stay with her faith community? So could you just restate that? For yeah, great question, Barb. Uh, her question was in regards to um, my comment about when we're dealing with both the abuser and the victim, and I mentioned about sometimes it means that one may have to leave. Which one is it going to be? Um, in my experience, it's always been the abuser that's had to leave, simply because the victim is often having a strong network of support already in the church. And so we certainly do, want, do not want to take that away from them. The other thing that I've discovered, it just and again, this is anecdotal, but the abuser often, in my case, when I have always sided in with the victim, the abuser, usually that breaks our relationship, so it's not as strong. So that's why I want them to get help, but I know I can't fulfill that role because I'm supportive of the victim. And that's why I try my best to get them to get to another church where they can re receive support, but it's very, very difficult for them to stay in the same church because, f unfortunately, even within the congregation, people will choose sides and, and form camps, and that's not healthy either. So that's one of the reasons why I've noticed in my experience going in that direction. Uh, does that help? Does it need to go to another church or does it need to go to treatment? 
Um, yeah, so the question was, do they, does a person have to go to another church or do they need to go for treatment? Obviously, treatment would be the, the logical choice and that's what you would hope and pray would happen. But again, in my experience, often there is a resistance to that. As Dr. Clark mentioned, it's always helpful if the relationship is built with the clergyman so that you can work with the abuser and they can be referred for help and you can actually walk alongside with them on that. But often that is not the case in, in my experience. It, it's been a more of a hostile thing where they feel as a clergyman, I'm siding in with the victim. And that's why I always try to give that other alternative for them to get the help. But I certainly, one of the first things would be encouraging them to try to get that treatment. One of the things we found that I think is very interesting in our work, in, the, in one of our projects where we followed about 1,200 case files, we looked at the likelihood of a man completing 52 weeks of mandated batter intervention program if a judge had mandated that he do that, and it's about 60%. If it's a, a religious man and the a pastor or priest or whoever the religious leader might be also encourages attendance, it goes up to 80%. So it's really important to have that extra moral authority, the weight of the religious leader for those who are religious. Now, of course, that doesn't operate for those who, who, don't have a, who don't see the priest or the pastor, the imam or whoever as their spiritual leader. But for those who do, the coordinated response really increases the buy-in to the program. And in the work that we've been doing where we've been interviewing men who've been abusive, uh, Barb and I have been for uh, several years now, every six months, we've had a, a group of 50 men that we followed for four years. And we've interviewed them every six months over a four-year period, and this is the book that we're working on at the moment. And one of the things that comes over and over again, very clear there, is that having an extra accountability structure is extremely important. And, and for those who, who have already given assent to a religious authority structure, then when that can be put into place, irrespective of what that is, by the religious leader, it's a really important part of walking alongside them and in, in encouraging safety and security for their family. And so, I mean, I think this is very interesting because often religious leaders feel that they make no difference. And that's not what our research shows. They do make a difference. I mean, they make a difference in the lives of those who've been victimized, but they also can make an incredible difference in the lives of those who've been abusive. And so if we're going to stop the pattern, or if we're going to begin to respond to that, this is an important step. Well, one of the best kept secrets of congregational life is the support that women often offer to other women that nobody else knows about. And so in one of our studies where we looked at 24 different communities, and in those communities we did focus groups in the, in the, in the churches, what we found is that a very large proportion of other women had offered support to women in the communities of faith, and their pastors did not know that this was happening. And so it might be something like food, it might be something like childcare, it might be something like uh, driving the children somewhere, it might be something like loaning a vehicle, it might be offering a bed for the night when she was too frightened to go home. And so the, the, the informal social support network, particularly in very conservative congregations where there's a gender division, of, of that is, is just cannot be overstated. And so for many women of faith, where they look first is to other women of faith when the family's falling apart. And so it, it, one of the things that we've been doing is trying to encourage and support and come alongside with information to help those lay volunteers who are often called upon, not because they're asking to be, but just because they're at the right place at the right time. Worker from Moncton, and uh, I have a question for you as well, actually. Uh, 
your empowerment project and the man to man project. Uh, are there any plans to perhaps in store that um, and use that as a tool to help the religious leaders in feeling confident and insightful in maybe mediating and facilitating uh, groups to address you know, whether the people be in the situation or to address what the uh, parishioners you know, would hear in the situation? Mm -hmm. I'll try. <laughs> so um, Gabby was asking about uh, toolkits that we have called the Empowerment Project and Man-to-Man. Uh, -Man. Uh, they're educational toolkits to raise awareness about and, and work towards um, prevention of sexual violence. And they're directed at youth. And so he was asking about um, looking at how those perhaps can be used in faith communities. And actually, when I was um, reading um, Nancy's research, that, and one of the things was talking about uh, youth leaders um, not necessarily talking about healthy relationships or, or dating violence um, in their groups, and thinking about that that would be an, a perfect opportunity that that we provide facilitator training. Um, we've just finished three days of facilitator training for these toolkits, and we're doing more training uh, in June uh, with people that work in their communities uh, in, different, uh, in different agencies or different, um, different venues um, and work with youth and want to raise awareness about this is issue, work at skill building, work at changing attitudes that may lead to, to violence in relationships. So it's a, it's a perfect opportunity and we would be more than, um, more than happy to be called upon to provide that and, and offer it also, I guess, to Way Street. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. And I just put a little plug in here for our RAVE project too. One of the things that we've been working really hard to do is to develop curricula and various things that can be used in various contexts. And Kathy Holtman has been helping with the development of what's called the dating game. And it's a, a, a tool, it's, it's on, our, on our site for church youth groups where you, know, uh, you pick cartoon characters and you have them you know, go on a particular date and you identify healthy and unhealthy things about their relationship. It's just in its development phase, it's far from being done and we need to be looking for large uh, amounts of money to move forward on that particular angle of the project. But I just, you've all got a, a post, uh, what shall I call it, a, a bookmark when you came in with uh, identifying our RAVE project and I'd invite you to have have a look at that at some point over the next little while and if some ideas occur to you email them to me or to the rave project itself because we're always developing we always want new ideas to to move it forward I'm Yosef Golden I'm the rabbi of the community here and my question is for Nancy mostly but I'd like to know what all of you think about this in my judgmental thoughts, I still am very judgmental. I believe that one of our biggest problems in the 21st century is that we separate the religion and the state. That we have the faith community and that we have the secular community. That the two don't share values with each other, and you, you touched on that, but the idea that, uh, that we even see it as, as normal, that, that these 15 and 16 year olds are dating, which wouldn't have been heard of for 40 years ago, or, or 30, even 30 years ago. Um, and it's mostly because like, they're living only a very secular life. They come to church once a week, or, or if they're pushed to a little bit more. But otherwise, it's really a very, very big separation. And so I think a lot of our expectations are built on, I would call it the blowing out these fires, but not dealing with the things at the root of the problem. Well, of course, that's very true, but there's, a, there's another perspective. Can you, can you sort of oh. Oh, yes. that <laughs> That's a very challenging thing to do. We had to do it. You can do it. Yes, I'll try. Uh, the question is, uh, when you think about young people, what are some of the influences and why do we think of a separation of church and state when it comes to the lives of young people? And, and uh, the rabbi is, is challenging me from my sort of... Uh, the notion that I'm, I'm looking at those as, as, as opposites in, in some way. And he's saying that maybe we're encouraging um, uh, individuals to be getting together and to be thinking about their interpersonal context. I've grown up in church life, let me tell you, every youth group has about 25 women and five men and you're not gonna let go hold of one of those guys if you happen to catch them. 
<laughs> now, the, the, the synagogue might be very different. But I've heard about Jewish camps, church, the camps in the summer. Let's face it, our kids, one of the things that happens throughout the world with faith communities is parents want their children to meet other sheep, bah, not the goats. And so part of the reason that it is so incredibly important for churches to take it seriously about the interpersonal relationships when they're, when they're in their teen years is because that sows the seed for what is to happen. What we have found in our research is a young woman is less likely to tell her mother if there's violence in the relationship if she's dating a young man of the same faith. If she's dating somebody outside the faith community, she's more likely to tell. So we have to be deliberate. That's my point of view. And that we need to move on it as quickly as we can. No. Just, just to respond to uh, Yosef's comment, I, I mean, I think ideally we should see a holistic approach. And I long for that, but I think the reality is, is that there is a somewhat of a separation of the faith community and the secular agencies. But I think, I think we're moving in the right direction, where there is more dialogue, and so that there will be more of a holistic point of view towards this, because that's where, again, I believe it's going to really shatter the silence when we have that more holistic look at that. Um, but there's some huge challenges, especially with our young people, and that's why I love what Nancy suggests about our youth leaders and our youth pastors, you know, speaking into the lives of our young people at a very critical state, at a very critical age, over these very important issues. <laughs> well, um, we've come to the end of our formal uh, section seating, but our uh, speaker and respondents, I'm sure, would be delighted to uh, interact with you informally uh, uh, following this, uh, these comments. Um, I'd like to thank our speaker, Lindsay Nason Clark, who, for giving us uh, a lot to think about, and our special guests, uh, Reverend Terry Atkinson and Ms. Lorraine uh, Wally, for, uh, for contributing to the discussion. Uh, thank you again to our patrons for their support, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Um, a video of this evening's presentation will be posted on the Ideas That Matter website, uh, umb.ca slash ideas, in a few days. Uh, the address is also printed on your program. Uh, I encourage you to check out videos of some of our previous lectures as well. Uh, let me announce the next lecture in the series will take place in the fall. On October the 9th, Dr. Melanie Weiber, Professor of Anthropology, at UMB Fredericton will give a talk that is tentatively entitled Carving Up Canada's Oceans, Who Gets a Say? She will be speaking about how agriculture, uh, tidal power, and oil and gas affect fishing, tourism, beach access, property amenities, and transport, and I hope you will join us for that lecture as well. Thank you again for coming this evening, and good night.